Hi guys, how are you? It's Monday again and it's me, Alex, your sassy dispatch girl. Well, what are we going to be talking today? Today is a little bit terrifying subject. Are you afraid? Are you terrified to call brokers? Well, as a new dispatcher, you know that we have a fear. How I'm going to make that phone call? Wow. Are they going to hang up on me? Are they going to feel that I am new? Are they going to take advantage of me? Well, we're going to discuss all this. And hopefully after this session, you guys are not going to be afraid to make those phone calls. You guys are going to know what to ask. And we're also going to have two guests. We're going to have two freight brokers who are working in this field for a long time. And we're going to ask them their opinion, what to do, what should you ask for sure, how to deal with negotiation, how to deal with uh, problems during the transit, and all other good things. So let's go back to what things you should ask before you accept the load. And as many of you know, you guys can find our classes on our website, Learn Dispatch Today. We have safety classes, dispatch classes. We're going to be adding the freight training in the uh, beginning of September. We're very proud to work with two uh, good brokers who are going to be teaching you uh, and me as well. Also, we have our IFTA classes coming up in July 17th. And of course, do not miss our next safety classes. But let's see, who are the freight brokers? Well, the freight brokers can be an individual or it can be company which brings together shippers who has goods, right? Any goods. Let's say water, they grow oranges. It can be a farm. It can be uh, manufacturing. It can be reseller. It can be retailer. We have a lot of shippers and also we have receivers, people who sell the goods. So they have to buy product from the shipper and they, they distribute. So what are we? We as we as a carrier, we are motor carrier, and we have two different kinds. We have private motor carrier, and usually it's company who provides trucks and transportation of their own uh, cargo. Usually, if you are a dispatcher, you are working for motor carrier for hire. So this is a company who gets paid for moving freight from A to B. But how are we going to find that freight? Are we going to go direct to shipper? Well, that's an option if you have a lot of trucks and you can have capability of moving 100 loads. But usually, we need the help of the freight broker. So again, freight broker, it's someone in the middle who connects uh, shippers, receivers with motor carriers. Then we also have freight forwarder. And I want you to understand the difference between freight broker and freight forwarder. Well, usually freight forwarder, it's a, a also freight broker, but they are putting the largest shipments together. They use the air, air, they have their housing, so that's why they freight forwarders. You can work as a dispatcher for freight broker. You can be a dispatcher for freight forwarder. You can be dispatcher for the carrier. You can also be an independent dispatcher. Well, usually we need to make sure we know who are we working with, right? You can hear all the time, well, the brokers are going to be checking on us. How new are we? If we've been in business for more than six months, a year. But do we have to check on the brokers as well? Well, do we need to make sure they have a good rating? Do we need to make sure that we know how they pay? And do we need to know how long they've been uh, operating? How do we guys do that? Well, if you sign up for any load, load uh, board, you can find that right there. So let's see. For example, right now I am on that. If I am going to put uh, my truck, uh, let's say tomorrow, in Santa Fe Springs, California. Let's say he's a drive-in, full load, 53, 46 max. You can put any comments here. Let's just post. Because at this point, I just want to see our third-party logistics, our brokers. So look at this, how many we have. We can organize them by ABCs. So let's say uh, we're going to open five rivers logistics. You can click right here, and you can see some data on the broker as well. 
So not only brokers are checking on you. You should also know, I don't know, my internet or that today actually have been acting up. Hopefully it's going to open up. You can see that the Three River Logistics has been in business since 2011. Look at this. They are having 250 surety bond, which is mandatory by FMCSA. Minimum requirements is 75. They do have 250, which is a good sign. You can see where they located that they are broker, authorized broker for property. They are from Arkansas. You can see their MC number. You can see that they are having uh, active status. Their bond is on file. And you can check all of this course. What do you want to pay attention to? Well, their credit score, right? How good they pay to us. DTP, days to pay. In this case, they are 16 days, which is not bad. So that makes them probably an A brokerage. Is that important to also check them with your factory? Yes, it's important. So look at all these guys. How do you know who you're going to be working with? Well, you need to do a little research. But let's go back to the questions. Well, again, if they have a good rating, if they approved by your factoring, what is DTP day to pay? Are they going to be paying for lumpers, all the other things? We're going to ask all of those questions. And I'm going to introduce you to freight brokers who are going to be talking uh, about all the questions we are asking them. And hopefully, guys, we're not going to be afraid to ask them ever again. I will be back in a second. Let's <music> Well, hi, guys. Welcome. Let's see who we have today. If you please can introduce yourself, tell us how long you've been a freight broker. Uh, if you started broke, uh, working for the brokerage right away, maybe you were in different fields. So tell us where you guys located, what you've been doing, and who you work for, and uh, which part of the brokerage are you at. Let's start with a uh, guy. Hey, my name is Guy. Um, so I've been in the industry for about four years, give or take. I graduated college. I interned for LD Logistics before my senior year, and then I got the job after I graduated. Um, we're based out of the Bronx. We focus basically on produce loads, so that's the majority of my experience. And okay. Okay, nice to meet you. Of course, I know you because I work with you all the time. And we have John. My name's John. I've been in the business since June of 2010. I started out at a brokerage firm, and then I moved over to an asset-based brokerage carrier. Mm -hmm. And after about a year of my seven-year tenure there, I started dispatching trucks. So I have a, um, a wide experience as both a broker and a motor carrier. And I currently work with Guy at LD in the Bronx. Okay. So let me ask you this. Do you sense the new dispatcher? How do you sense them? Is that because they're nervous or because they don't know what questions to ask? Do you really feel when you're talking to a person who's been doing it for a while or you know that somebody's just brand new? So... Typically, when uh, you have a brand new dispatcher, they end up going by a script and they ask a lot of the same questions that you've already answered before they ask them, such as where is the load picking up? What's the zip code? How late do they ship? What are you paying? So in, it's been my experience that when you have people asking these questions multiple times, you do tend to lose a little faith in their ability to get the job done. Confidence is key in this business. Okay. So asking the same question, because as I tell in my class, listening and hearing is two different things. Sometimes because you guys tell information fast, right? And they are a little bit scared and uh, they repeating, right? You already told them about well, load picking up in Yakima. It's going to Bronx market and they are so terrified. They're like, so where is it picking up again? 
All right. So, so <laughs> a big thing right now with the repeating questions and whatnot. So like, for example, right now, so like from our side as a broker, we can start booking loads at eight, 9 a.m. And by noon, the rate's substantially higher. So literally time is money. Okay. So you can tell right away when someone is like not that interested in your load, when they call in and they're just fishing for a rate, they want to see, you know, how much the truck is worth that day. Mm -hmm. So you can tell right off the bat, but if you're confident, if you're calling into the broker as a dispatcher and you're confident and you ask the right questions, then, you know, it's not an issue at all. Okay. So let's look at this little, little kind of script, which I do give to to my students, right? So some questions which I want them to ask for sure. So let's look at this. So does it make sense to ask where the load starts, right? And then, are you agree with this that we have to ask? Doesn't matter if I'm pro or I'm new, yes. we need to know this, right? So okay, origin, origin of the load delivery. Here it is. When you throw in those days, guys, how are you really sure that the driver has those fresh hours? Because my problem with most of the brokers is misunderstanding of HOS or never asking the dispatcher if he has enough hours to make this transit. So this is another big issue. Let's say we have east to west or west to east. We have four or five day transit. So right off the bat, you know, if we're if we're posting it as a team, we, we need a team. We're expecting three to four days maximum, maximum. And if you post it as a solo, it'll be like five or six, right? Um, and let's say I post the load today. I'm like, it's picking up today, delivering on Friday. So right off the bat, that's the first thing we would say. So it, it should be assumed that the truck, like you shouldn't even call if your truck can't make a five, six day run as a solo. And I'm telling you it delivers Friday. You should say, I'm sorry, like my, my driver doesn't have the hours. And if that's not said, then then that's an issue from the dispatcher's point of view. Okay. So let's, be let's, let's really make sure before I call as a dispatcher, it should be my responsibility to check HOS of my driver to see already. It's picking up in Yakima. Let's say it's going to Jasset, Maryland, 2,800 miles, right? So I need enough time to make this transit especially if we are talking about the produce, right? But still, when you hear that little bit terrifying voice as a broker, don't you think that you want kind of make sure that, are you sure that your driver is fresh on hours? Because when we're talking cost to cost, this is so easy to mismanage. Even if you are short by five hours, boom, now you're somewhere in Cleveland, Ohio, waiting for your restart, 34 hours late for your giant, uh, right? for your brand's market with cherries, which is a high commodity, for example, and then you have a rejection. So don't you think that brokers kind of doesn't matter if that's pro dispatcher or not, should also verify that, like make it clear. It's a great question and you can also talk to them. You can make it across the country without a full book if you're running proper recap hours as well. That's exactly. such an important concept to understand as a broker, that way, you might need to uh, recover your trailer halfway across the country if the driver has to do a reset on a load of cherries. Okay. So obviously knowing... something that both parties want to avoid, right? Exactly. Yeah. Nobody wants to have to haul the trailer. Okay. Mid what, what about having the right equipment for this load? How important for you as much as for me to verify, are you really looking for the reefer air ride? Maybe if you are hauling uh, eggs, right? Air ride would be very, uh, <laughs> very nice to have. Also, how old is your unit? How often do you guys verify when you ask how old is your unit? Is dispatcher telling you how old is his trailer or how old his, for example, reefer unit? I would say that most of them know, and some of them even believe it as a selling point. Um, sometimes yeah. they'll say, oh, I have a 2020 carrier reefer and it's it's brand new and it can hold the temperature at 32 degrees, no problem. Okay. It's, so yeah, negotiation, it, extra negotiation. So I'm calling you today and I say, well, uh, I put, let's say I, I did not work with you. Well, I have brand new equipment, brand new reefer, 2020. I have guy, 
20, I mean, not you guy, but my guy driver, my driver, 20 miles away, 30 miles away, empty, ready to go, fresh hours. Don't you think I would have extra negotiation power when we're going to be talking about that rate? If, if you're as confident as you just said it, then yeah. It's all about the confidence. <laughs> confidence. It depend too on the commodity. If you're hauling potatoes at 65 exactly. degrees, I don't really care that you have a, a 2010 reefer, but if you're hauling ice cream at negative 20 or cherries that have to be at 33, have to be precise, either you freeze it or it's just you know too hot, you need to make sure that your unit is up to grade. So let's ask this question because you guys mostly working with a produce, right? Produce and most of your loads come from Washington. Right now is a cherry season than California. Uh, you don't work that much with Florida. You still do, but not as much as, as far as I know. How important it is to verify that mode continues or stop and go? How important is that for you to make sure you still tell the dispatcher, doesn't matter how good I am. Don't you want to kind of highlight in your rate confirmation? Don't you want to make sure that it is crucial when it's cherries? Maybe apples, the density of the apple, you know, it's 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 easy. It doesn't spoil as fast as cherries. So don't you think that some of the steps you as a broker should uh, explain a few more times to the driver, to me as a dispatcher. And of course, if I'm a professional dispatcher, you don't have to do that because I'm already trained my drivers, right? But we have 60% of the new dispatcher who don't even understand the importance of continuous, of stop and go, of, of pull the temperature. So I would say the general rule, at least for the, the produce loads that we run, is run as per bills, right? No matter what, run as per bills. If there's any discrepancy, or if you're confused, or you don't, or you just want to confirm, once the load is picked up, email, call, and verify exactly what temperature to run at, because that's the most important part of the. Well, let me ask trend. you this: Well, I have my driver. All my drivers are trained to pull the temperature. I pull the temperature of the cherries. You tell me they have to be at 33. They are at 45. As a broad dispatcher, I am not going to let my driver leave the facility unless you're going to okay and not via phone, via email, right? Correct. Yep. Absolutely. You, at that point, that's when you, ha you have to instruct the drivers as well. Take pictures when you're pulping products, send it to the dispatcher. If it seems off, if it seems too high or too low, us as our as brokers, we have to contact the customers and also through email, we need the okay to go. So then once we get to delivery, if there's any temperature discrepancies, then we have that. Let's back. see this. Most of the dispatchers and most of the drivers get pissed at you guys, brokers, because you lie about the weight, about the pallets count, about the detention, if the product is ready. Why do you guys do that? That's a bit of a loaded question. <laughs> let's, well, one, let's, one talk about, let's talk about pallets first. Do you guys know every load that details for sure? How no. many loads? No. Why we don't. not? So sometimes we get pallet counts, sometimes we get case counts. If you get case counts, it's going to be more accurate. And then at that point, it depends on how it's palletized. So ultimately, we are paying for the full use of the truck contracted to haul a minimum of 42,500 pounds. It's in every contract. That way we don't deal with this loads heavier than we thought or anything like that. Well, 42 and a half, it's never 42 and a half. Again, because of the pallet weight. So that's me as a professional dispatcher. When I'm asking you about how many pallets, not because I am picky, because I know that every pallet is 60 to 70 pounds. So if we're talking about 22 pallets multiplied by 60, it's extra weight, a certain amount. But if it's just 12 pallets, so do you understand why sometimes when we are clo uh, closer to that max weight, me as a dispatcher, I need to know this? Absolutely. And it depends if your truck has a uh, single or a dual drive axle. Because then you're talking about 35,000 pounds versus, you know, an extra 10 or 11,000 pounds the truck can haul. Okay, well, I'll ask you this, loading. They loaded the truck, 
my guy goes to scale because yes in my company it's mandatory a lot of people don't do that then they start driving and they get stopped somewhere in uh, north dakota in fargo because they're overweight on even on axle they can be eighty thousand, but they can be overweight on the front axle on the trailer axle so let me ask you this here's a friday i got loaded with your fancy cherries rain cherries right which is value probably hundred uh, not hundred thousand but hundred twenty five so should i verify the value of the load it depends if you're uh if you're covered for it via your insurance so most carriers only have a hundred thousand dollars worth of cargo insurance some okay. brokers will have an umbrella policy that will cover an additional amount ld is one of those brokers because we don't want to leave ourselves exposed to financial liabilities from a carrier not having enough of a cargo insurance amount on their policy so if I am booking the yellow cherries with you, you telling me that that extra 25 grand, 30 grand, you're going to cover, right? Because you do have umbrella coverage. We are covered. That does not mean that the carrier is absolved of responsibility should something happen to the product. That means our okay. customer is covered. And at that point, we have to work out the additional amount with the carrier. Okay, so now you kind of contradicted me. Don't you need to make sure that if the value is more than 100, you should verify as a broker if I'm okay to take in this load? Well, we're covered for it, though. I understand your point. We want to make sure the carrier is covered. So ultimately, it is on the broker to make sure that they have an updated certificate of insurance covering the full value of the product. Okay. So reefer breakdown. Okay. We go to scale. I am overweight on the axle, 8 p.m., already Saturday. You really, really need that load in Bronx. I'm calling you and saying, well, I am overweight on the axle. How many times does it happen and brokers say, well, just, just keep going. We need to bring those cherries. If Never. you're overweight, if you're le oh, legally. I am not overweight 80,000, but I am loaded wrong. You're a cherry production if you're, already if you're loaded in correctly if the weight is off and by any way mm -hmm. we go back to the shipper no matter what we don't expect the trucks to drive illegally across the country okay i'm just telling you because i dispatch every day and i have brokers who will tell you just keep going just keep going we need that product okay what about produce detention don't you love this right now <laughs> how many drivers get pissed at you and i was a witness of you getting a conversation with one of the drivers who was screaming at you like sorry f word in you and everything else i wish i could put it on the air but i can't <laughs> this is the private stuff but, Roman. but tell me yeah, the Roman, you know, screaming, taking the cargo, right? P pressing all this drama just to get extra money. Well, don't you guys explain to them, and especially for the new guys, that this is a produce. I mean, as an experienced dispatcher, I already know, well, it's produce, like watermelons, cherries, even strawberry salad. Sometimes you have to wait until it's going to be picked. That's why you guys paying already more money than for other freight because of the produce right but it's okay let's say things goes wrong yeah i pick out half of the load and it starts draining i mean can you control this no can i control this at dispatcher no so we have pissed driver he's pissed not just on you guys he's pissed at me he screams at me that i'm a bad dispatcher he tells me why do i work with a terrible terrible broker who is uh, making us take loads instead of one pick now he's adding yakima or Venachi or chila and what do we do that what is the policy for your company for like layover and how do you solve now the problem being on time because we are talking about strict deliveries cns giants we go i mean bronx market is easier but we have very strict receivers right with the late fees so now we are delayed right how are you guys managing that and how much would you pay uh, layover? Um, so there's a few questions there. So generally, if a truck lays over from Monday to Tuesday overnight, we hmm. pay 250 standard layover. Um, there's a few instances, especially on loads that we know, like in Arizona, Texas, if, this, if product needs to cross the border. And we know in advance it's going to be very late, midnight to 3 a.m., but while we're negotiating, we will we'll, we'll include extra money for that added time. 
So we can take care of it that way from the beginning. Okay. So if the truck sits till 8 a.m., we already paid you for the layover. You're loaded and you start rolling. Um, detention policy, for the most part with produce, anything under four or five hours, we don't pay detention. Okay. Um, anything more, we can start negotiating. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's different on every load, different product. And probably the carrier you work with, right? Because if yeah. I've been working with you and I've been loyal and I don't scream and F word you, right? But I understand the situation, probably I'll get, uh, I'll get a little bit extra. Well, let's say this. Remember last week I had my truck going with your load apples and we had to reschedule for later delivery. Here we're talking about late fees from CNS. Well, hopefully I'm not going to get charged. Well, because let's say why not because i'm special but don't you think that dispatcher when something uh, happens right away have to notify you it was not working day i think it was happening on saturday sunday it was weekday i had to make sure i text you right away i called you right away i found i had to pay for the toll twelve hundred dollars we had to pay for the repairs luckily i had apples right but still the stress was still here but how important it is for carriers, dispatchers, not to make up stupid stories. Let's say this way, because breakdowns do happen. I mean, I wish I would have a crystal ball and know, oh, my breakdown is going to be here. My breakdown is not. Then I would not be teaching classes. I would be just telling everybody when you're going to have breakdown, when you're not. But I cannot predict that, right? But how important it is to have communication? It is absolutely essential. Uh, for example, I had a carrier this past Sunday when I was working, missed two deliveries. And because he didn't communicate with us, I couldn't notify the customer in a timely manner. And his deliveries are currently scheduled for Friday due to appointment availability. Um, I wish there was something I could do, but this whole idea of, well, maybe we'll sneak in or we don't need to tell everybody everything because it's Sunday, nobody's working. It doesn't fly when you're hauling perishable produce especially in a tight market where there's just so many so many loads going into the receivers yeah so receiver. what, what's gonna happen first he's probably gonna have light fees right he's gonna have Correct. late fees because reschedule fees schedule. late fees yep. and what is his commodity for example uh he is hauling grapes so they're a little more hardy it's not like it's okay. cherries or berries that have a very limited shelf life um but they're still but a sensitive product to sit on the truck for an extra two, three days. Extra two, three days. So you actually thing. putting liability on your shoulders as well, because I mean, it's all great that we have coverages, but still insurance is insurance and it can take months and months and months to get that money. Well, they so, won't cover it though, because it's not a reefer breakdown. It's not a cargo right. insurance. It's, hey, this carrier dropped the ball. And now when these, these grapes go in, they're gonna be received with protection. We might have problems of shriveling. We might have decay. This could be a $50,000 claim, and we're not we going to know until Friday also. night. We should bring that up. Receiving with protection is a big thing on these late. Yeah, so can, you, late can, you ex can you explain that in details? Uh, essentially, receiving with protection is they'll take the product off the truck. The receiver will take it in. They're going to try to sell it for as much as they can. If, if the value of the product decreased because of the time delay, Mm -hmm. then then they will clip us they'll take from our invoice and then that trickles down to the carrier yeah well. but sometimes in, that invoice is not enough to cover the difference because mm -hmm. let's say we're talking about the load even for cherries twelve thousand. if half of the cherries are going to be sold for third of what they cost i mean we're talking about 30 40 grand so correct so and to add on to what guy is saying in that case it's gonna go against what carriers claim right so you guys gonna put the claim so sometimes carrier don't understand that let's say we charge factoring factoring pays me right away 48 hours i have five loads with you right now right so i think oh it's okay whatever three pallets of chairs wow you still did not pay my factoring you still holding 50 grand of my five loads of chairs right are you gonna release that money if you have any issues with any of the loads absolutely not Okay. So we verify so, that the value of the product is less than what we have, then maybe we can pay one invoice or two, depending. But 
We always okay. make sure if it's a regular carrier that we work with and we have invoices. So let me ask you this. Them. As a new dispatcher, as a new carrier, should I really be also on your side and try to solve that? Even if that happens, we need to resell. We need to make sure that we are patient. We cannot be getting, because I've seen so many times that dispatchers start screaming. They start uh, uh, threatening the brokers and brokers get upset. I mean, but in the end of the day, who has the money, right? Who is on you the money, right? The broker. So I think if you have a good communication skill and you have a good relation, I mean, uh, people think, well, you guys do it on purpose. Guy, are you going to do it on purpose to make sure that your company makes an extra 5000 and I've been loyal to you for five years? Or are you going to try to minimize my loss and you're going to be... There's no need to jeopardize. The, if you have a genuine relationship with a carrier, you're not going to jeopardize it over even, even you know, tens of thousands of dollars. You want to keep that carrier in your back pocket. It's a good relationship to have. Um, like yeah, for example, we both need to solve that problem. We both need to make sure that that product yeah. is uh, sold, and our customers, whoever's buying from us, who or shipper, are paying both of us. Because if you have a problem with that, do you think that the customer is going to hold your money as well? Yeah. Right. And so you need brokers, to get paid as well. As brokers, we have we know different locations where we can send product to. If there's rejected product, we know where we can send product to get the best return. So let's say you're let's say you're delivering to Massachusetts. We can sell it in Massachusetts, but we'll get you know 40 cents to the dollar. But we know if we send the truck to the Bronx, we'll get 75 cents for the dollar. So just in that situation as well, it's like when I'm telling you or asking you for it's in your best interest to drive to the Bronx and sell this product. It's a matter of you know ten thousand dollars. Yeah, because we're talking about, yeah, so let's say extra 200 miles, but we're talking pounds and pounds of products. So when you really calculate that, that's the big difference, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Okay. What What about, uh, let's say it's not their fault. They were on time and there is a rejection of product because maybe it's our own size, maybe the quality. Whose fault is that, John? I don't think it's a, a fault thing. So that actually happened today. I had a load of cherries out of Washington going to Miami. Three times. And, and yeah, you're right, three times today. And it got rejected and it was due to quality. So I called the carrier up and I said, listen, this is not your fault. They're going to place it either in Miami at another facility or in Pompano. Mm -hmm. Now, typically when it's the same city, I'm already paying the guy $11,500 or whatever it was. You're getting $100 for the extra stop. And because it's not your issue, you're going to walk away from this scot-free. You're going to get your $11,100, and the relationship is kept intact. In this case, I would even give you 100 bucks to just to make sure you take the product, you know, if I'm a professional dispatcher. But let's say that what other uh, situation can be? It's, um, for example, you need to re-deliver. Let's say the Costco order a uh, big watermelons and somehow the farmer put the small. So issue due to the size. Costco doesn't want to receive them because they really order small watermelons. Now you're trying to resell and you found somebody, but now you need to re-deliver. How the dispatcher, new dispatcher, should negotiate that? Because most of the brokers have like any re-deliveries is going to be paid $1 per mile, $1.50. What are the policies for you guys? How do you look at it? Because it's not that fair to pay dollar a mile if you have to go 400 miles all, all the way to Portland, Maine, right? Where is no loads. So yeah. what, what do you guys do? Uh, so generally, the standard from what we do is $2 a mile. Let's say, you know, if you're in Jacksonville, we have to send you to Atlanta. And you deliver Friday night. You have to deliver Saturday morning. So we're going to pay a night's layover and then $2 a mile. That's the general. That's not bad. That's the general um, rate. Obviously, there's room for negotiation. And and at some point, it's not really in our control, to be honest. But that's our job to negotiate with the carrier. Because for, for all you know, they don't want to go to Atlanta. The truck has to go to Miami. So then it, we can also work on placing it somewhere else, but we're not going to give you the same rate. We're not going to give, if you're telling me you want to go to Miami, we're not going to give you $2 a mile because we're sending you where you want to go. And occasionally you will get strong armed by a carrier. Um, I contracted a carrier out of New Jersey to go to Jacksonville. He had a pickup in South Georgia right around Valdosta. 
and he had a rejection and it was his fault. And we could either send it to Miami or Atlanta. And I ended up having to pay him $1,800 to go to Atlanta because the value of the product, it was half a truckload of grapes. You're talking $25,000 worth of product. And now so, you, again, though, this is bringing back up the importance of having a good, you know, good relationship with a carrier, like carrier broker relationship, because at the end of the day, like the negotiation should be easy if you know the, the carrier well. Okay. Um, I have a carrier that, does, if, you know, if it's same day redelivery within a hundred miles, he doesn't charge me. He just wants the product off his truck. And again, that's like a check in on my end. I know like John, this dispatcher, anytime he has a truck, I'm more inclined to give him more money for his truck. Cause I know that there will be less issues. Well, it's uh, it's also the matter of loyalty, but also understanding you as a carrier, you want to get rid of that product as much as possible. Sometimes, it's not even about that hundred dollars. As I tell John, mm -hmm. I would give you hundred dollars, a hundred dollars, two hundred more. I would say deduct for me. Just take this out of my truck, right? But we have a different views. We have people who don't really understand. We have owner operators who don't understand the liability. But let's uh, ask you this: How many months carrier has to be in business? for you to make sure that you can get set up with them and give them the first produce load? It depends on what produce, but mm -hmm. typically you won't give anything to un anyone who's been around less than a year. And I try to do two years minimum for cherries, but with the truck market the way it is, you have to make exceptions. You have to do yeah. your due diligence. You have to check references. You have to make sure on Carrier 411, their phone number and the email they're using match what's on there. Everything on the government site matches. You have to really make sure you don't get screwed by somebody who is posing as somebody else. Well, also, you need to understand when we're talking about cross-country loads, carrier with one truck, well, sometimes you cannot give them the cherry load just because he can be a great guy. He can might have, but what is his backup plan? What is he going to do in case of breakdown, right? He doesn't have any other trucks who he doesn't maybe doesn't even have set up account for the rental. So this is this is a lot of a lot of things uh, to be involved. But here is the questions. Let's see how much do broker make on the average per load? Let's say in uh, average over 15 loads posted on a load board. Thank you. Well, everybody <laughs> wants to know how much you guys make. How much money you stealing for those poor guys and other dispatchers? Why? Why are you taking advantage of those new dispatchers? So, guys, why are you so mean? Tell me, tell me the load of twelve thousand dollars for cherries. Guys, are you making an extra I can 10? answer this one. I can answer are you gonna be <laughs> making an extra ten on top of it? Come I'm, on, guys. So my answer to that would be of course it depends. Like we negotiate just how you negotiate with us on a rate. We negotiate with our customer. Let's say I know I'm going to pay roughly twelve thousand dollars on a load for our company to pay twelve thousand dollars because we pay the carriers before the customer pays us. So for us to pay twelve thousand dollars, we're going to try to make on average, let's say ten percent, which right now is not happening because rates are just really high. But we'll work depending on the really? depending on the Everybody product. Everybody we'll thinks for, that you guys making 50, 60 percent. No, it's nowhere near that. We're running loads right now, California to New York, and we're making three hundred dollars a load after oh. lunch. We'll make three hundred. So we're spending over, you know, we're paying over eleven thousand dollars to make three hundred. It's it's not even worth it at some. But you okay. want to keep the relationship with the customer. Okay, yeah. let me ask you this: This is a high peak season. Now is a shortage, and capacity is going to be even tightening because of the holiday, right? We have Independence Day. A lot of people gonna go home, so you guys are gonna be paying. I had a class on Saturday. We just were making fun of all of you guys because we were posting drugs in Yakima in California, right? And some of you were willing to give us fifteen thousand, fourteen hundred, fourteen thousand, right? I love those classes because we can just ask for money and you have to pay because you, you need it. to cover those. So what do we call that? Well, spot market. Okay, spot market. In this case. Are you making money as a broker or you have to lose the money or you just do not take those loads if you cannot cover them? Because a lot of brokers, let's remember this, 
you like you said john before to get that first uh a customer you will need to suck it up also as a broker and take that flat rate for the whole year so then what are you gonna do john when you need to pay two three thousand extra it all depends if we're talking spot market i mean there have been instances where we've been quoted loads or we've given quotes we didn't get the load and then we're told okay we gave it to capital and then we see capital posting that load you see it for 11,000, then you see it for 11,3, then you see it for 12,000. Next thing you know, the customer's calling you saying, hey, the other guy gave the load back, do you still have the truck? It's been four hours, you don't have the truck, but now you know that you can go out and get an $11,500 truck and charge them 12 and a half and make $1,000. So if you're a good broker, you take the loss, you cover your customer's freight, you lose $500 and you move on and in their eyes, you're reliable and you keep them as a good customer. Today, but we still, hold, hold on, guy. But how many losses you can take? Let's say the spot market goes straight two weeks. You cannot keep losing 1,000, 1,500 per load just to uh, meet the demands of the customer. Don't you sometimes have to say sorry, but we just cannot take it? Or you have to come up with a price, right? You have to come up with a price, give them a solution, don't cause a problem for them just by giving the load back. I can think of exactly two instances in the last two years that LD has given a load back to its customers. We just don't do it. It's not good business. Okay, but then let's say on Saturday you have 10, 10 loads and you cannot find the trucks. Are you gonna, what are you gonna just magically, here Alex, where is the truck? Guy asked me, Alex, do you have any truck? And I'm like, no, I don't have any truck because I was making fun on Saturday of all the brokers, right? I was videotaping everybody, how much they were giving me. But still, let's say you cannot find the truck because sometimes it's no trucks. Are you managing them to say, okay, listen, we can manage this, but we have to move for Monday maybe. Because on Monday, everybody heard of what? Of 12,000, 14,000 over this weekend, everybody tries to get to Washington, right? So what's happening now? Now that we have more trucks, last load so maybe the same amount of the loads now the price is going a little bit down because you have more trucks right so you trying to give them solution right correct okay. yeah i mean in this circumstance though you're talking about covering loads on a saturday just don't do that cover them on friday cover them ahead of time and yes you might have to recover one or two but you're not covering 10 loads on a saturday set yourself up for success and avoid behaviors that will cause you to fail in this business so do you guys advise the shippers and buyers of all those trends like before holidays, before, it depends even on which day of the week it is, right? Because Monday truck user are usually cheaper than Friday truck, right? Always Saturday, cheaper than holiday. Yeah, Saturday truck sometimes can sky, right? Or sometimes no, because if it's no or cherries, if it's nothing, if it's just apples uh, or onions and potatoes, those uh, shippers don't even work on Saturdays, right? So it depends on the season, if it's a winter, if it's a summer, if, I mean, lots and lots of, uh, lots of things goes together. So you guys advise and give your hopefully professional numbers, right? And you tell them what to do and not to do, right? But let's go, let's go to that what not to do. You posted the load, right? You posted the load. Let's look at this. So let's pretend, guy, we're going to be playing this scenario, mm -hmm. okay? I'm calling you. Uh, hi, how are you calling in the posted load from Yakima to Bronx? Is it still available? Uh, yeah, it's available. Can I get your MC, please? Yes, my MC is 995912. Let's say, ah, uh, we are not set up, right? right? Yeah. So now the general process would be if we're not set up, so we would check carrier 411. What, as John stated earlier, we would check all the information, make sure the phone number, email, matches we'd verify how long they've been in business okay. and well, let's say and here, proceed. you know what guy uh actually i took classes from alex i've been working for her and she referred me i know that i'm just eight months in business but i have five guys you can call her verify can you set me up so in that instance so another big thing with setting up a carrier is you you must check references you need references so if someone uses you as a reference that's a big positive I know you personally. Um, if they've ran any other loads, it doesn't matter if it was produce or not. 
Uh, if they have any relationship with a broker, list them as a reference. We'll contact them and say, hey, Al, I'm speaking to Alex. Just okay. want to make sure that she's good, well, that she communicates and all so that. So I'll tell you, that's all we got in set up. How do you guys get set up nowadays? Link or PDF? What do you guys uh, have? PDF. We'll send the PDF. PDF and then... How long is it going to take? Let's say we're talking about world today. Usually, how long does it take for you to set me up? If so, if you're prepared for the setup, so we have a we have our packet that we send out, mm -hmm. and then you as a carrier, it's advised that you have a packet as well. It makes yep. everything carrier set up. That's what we file. You send them, yeah. everything over at once. The references okay. already ready. Insurance. Um, yeah. your W nine. Do you require us to put you as a certificate holder? At LD, we don't necessarily require it, but again, if it's a company that we don't know, then we would do it. Okay. So let's talk about equipment. When equipment type. So you posted as a reefer, right? I am calling you and I did not really pay attention. We're talking about the load, but I do have when a uh, wanted when. So are you gonna verify with me what kind of equipment I uh, I have or you're going to trust me that I already know what you need. How does it go, John? Do you ever verify the equipment I have? So what we do is we always note the commodity and the temperature. Mm -hmm. The fact that you're saying what temperature you want the reefer to run, you'll say, okay, it's grapes. Please run the reefer at 34, you know, pre-cool 34. Let us know what the bills say. You are not explicitly asking, do you have a reefer? But you are going over every single step of how they want, how you want the reefer to run what you will be hauling in the reefer. So it's in the conversation if it's not implicitly asked. Okay, so should be kind of self-explanatory. I mean, even if you're a new dispatcher, if you have reefer, you post as a reefer. Yes, you can have van or reefer load, but then you're not gonna be asking about the temperature. Okay, so what is a commodity? Uh, commodity is cherries or apples in this case, if we're setting you up. Okay. Let's make sure that it's different commodities combined, perishables. So can you explain for people what perishables mean? So perishables are anything that needs to have a temperature maintained, anything that can spoil. So you're talking fresh foods, any type of produce, mixed vegetable, eggplant, asparagus, even meat is considered a perishable as well as frozen ice, well, all ice cream is frozen. Um, so ice cream, frozen fish, um, anything that can spoil if the temperature is significantly altered would be considered a perishable commodity. Okay. So for sure, are you going to tell me that it's apples for sure? Or sometimes you don't know because I have a lot of brokers who would tell, well, it could be apples, it can be pears, it can be cherries, it can be, it, it's just a produce. Well, for me as a pro dispatcher, that's not enough because again, because of the liability. I would take apple, I would take grapes, I would not take asparagus, and I'm not going to take cherries. I am going to stay away from blueberries. Yes, it's still produce, right? So are you always going to tell the dispatcher exactly what commodity is? Yeah, you have to. That's you have to because it's an expensive product because you could spend five, ten minutes, you know, let's say we're booking asparagus out of Florida. We we're spending five, ten minutes booking this load. And then they ask at the end, what's the commodity? And we say asparagus. And they're like, oh, actually, we don't haul asparagus. So yeah. you like to get it out of the way early in the phone call. So everyone's on the same page. There's no confusion as okay. to what the product is or what the load is. So how heavy is it? 42,000 pounds, full load. Is it palletized? Yes. Okay. Is it weight including pallets? Yes, for the most part. It's a very important question because if you're hauling 43 and a half thousand pounds of potatoes, it might be on pallets. Then you have to add another 75 pounds per pallet. But if it's floor loaded, some carriers might not haul that. They don't want all these. I mean, I've had a driver try to sweep out these little baby fingerling potatoes out of the grooves in his reefer. Yeah. And you need a washout after delivery. And if you deliver it on the East Coast, how many washouts there? So let me ask you this. Let's say it's bulk potatoes. Are you going to reimburse us for washout of the trailer? No, you have to include it in the rate. That way there's no, I went to this place and it was 75. Well, why didn't you go to this place? That was 25. 
it's okay. in the rate. So that's so why you, you guys do not reimburse for washout. Okay. Also, uh, it's implied, you know, when we're when we're contracting the truck, we're it should be ready to go, washed out, and ready to go. There's, when you're hauling food. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going because you know I am that new dispatcher. I don't really know what to ask, and I am reading from Alex's script. Is there any special instructions to the driver? Uh, that depends on the load, you know. Give me a um, few special instructions. Maybe pulp the temperature of the produce. Is that instruction? Yeah. Pulp the temperature. Make sure your reefer is pre-cooled before arrival to prevent delays in loading. Make sure that your driver counts the cases or counts the pallets or verifies. Well, that pick up appointments, a big one. So what yeah. about securement? All of our rate cons say that the driver must secure the load. If the driver does not think the load is secured, he is to let us know before he leaves the shipper. For example, if they don't put airbags in with the strawberries, driver gets to the receiver. You have the last two pallets of strawberries fell over. And then he says, well, the shipper didn't secure it properly. It's in our contract that the driver must say something at the time of loading. If he doesn't, it's on him and he will have a claim and he will have to pay the claim. Okay. What about, um, for example, seal? Uh, all trailers must be sealed and the seal number must be written on the bills. This prevents a simple issue of shortage going back on the carrier. If the shipper seals the trailer and it was 3,000 cases instead of 3,500 cases, that's on them. Especially with COVID procedures of loading nowadays where drivers are not allowed on the dock to count. It's a mm -hmm. shipper load and seal. Drivers and if free the shipper and does not, if the shipper doesn't put a seal or doesn't have a seal as they claim, the carrier has to reach out, make sure we know, so we can let the customer know as well. We can mm -hmm. say, "Hey, there's no seal." Shipper saying they don't have any. Are we good to roll the truck? Okay, well, let's keep going. Will be there any lumpers for loading or unloading? Are you gonna reimburse? Or now I have to pay also since you did not pay for my washout. Um, on LD, we reimburse all lumpers for the most part, unless sometimes there's, if there's leaning pallets and the lumper is more expensive, then it's on. And I, had, I never have a problem with you guys paying for your uh, lumpers. I just do not like when you include that $100 prepaid for lumpers. It's never 100 Please, guys, stop doing that because it's messing up with my RTS, with accounting. Then I have to reach out back. Can you guys like have a meeting and say, it's not smart to do. Do not prepay. Just tell that you're going to reimburse with a valid receipt after that because you're confusing those new dispatchers and those drivers. I think right. It's, it's company <laughs> policy. Okay. <laughs> what about the micro tracking of the driver? Do you guys require that or it's optional? It's not optional, but um, unless it's a high value load that we specify ahead of time, we'll be fined. If you know the driver doesn't mm -hmm. accept macro point, it, it is what it is. We have a guy who does tracking in the morning. If the drivers didn't accept macro it point, it also depends on communication from the carrier. Though, if the carrier does not communicate well, if we can't reach you on the phone in the morning, mm -hmm. then we will we won't work with you unless we can track your drivers. Because then it just it's added stress and added work for us to try to find whether your truck is okay. And we already talk about detention layover pay, so that's all taken care of. Well, when you guys are really negotiating that, are you going off the board market pace? Or let's say I am new dispatcher and I really did not check that. Are you going to throw that number at me like, oh, I'm calling about this load from Yakima to, let's say, Newark, New Jersey. How much you paying? Guy, are you telling right away or are you asking how much would you want? Um, For the most part, I'll... Straight up, say I, like today, I'd be like, I'm looking to pay around ten thousand, and okay. then we can start the negotiation from there. So, Do you guys post your loads with a price, or you keep it open? Depends. Yeah. It, it depends. Are we having trouble moving it? Yeah, then you throw a twelve thousand dollar bone on the board. Somebody's gonna bite. Mm -hmm. If but you if have a four pick load and you know you're gonna pay twelve thousand dollars, thirteen thousand dollars right now. Instead of posting four picks, two drops, I'm going to put a one and one. I'm just going to post, you know, Wenatchee to Miami, $13,000. And then it'll generate phone calls. And then. But that's when that dislike comes because you miss posting. 
I don't want a call broker who has one on one, and then I start talking to you, and then you tell me add in Venacci and Yakima and this and that because you should find the people who are okay with multi pick, multi drop. But I can understand you sometimes no one's gonna call you because when you put three picks, three drops, mm -hmm. well, I'm definitely not calling you. When there's when there's no trucks posted on DAT and we have no one, no regulars left, you post a high rate, you generate phone calls. Let's say I've posted 13,000 for all I know, I pay 14, 14, five, mm -hmm. you know, it just, it gives, it starts room for negotiation with the people that are calling on the 13,000, $14,000 loads are looking for money. Okay. So here we have, a, thing, hold on. So, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. John. I was going to say, there's one thing that's very important. I'm going to shoot myself in the foot on this one, but if you are a carrier who is based out of Oklahoma, for example, and you receive a phone call from a broker on your LA truck on a shipment out of LA back to Oklahoma City. He is going to lowball you because mm -hmm. he's going to know you're on a back haul. He's going to know you got paid on your head haul, and you just need to get the truck home. Take that into consideration when you're, or if you're a Jersey carrier and your a broker's calling you on Florida to New Jersey, you are not going to hear the market rate from him. Well, and if you're a Chicago carrier you will always ask always ask six seven thousand extra which is not possible <laughs> on the market so this is also the truth here you go our european chicago land carriers right <laughs> yeah. uh, does it make does it make difference yes it does right so let's say you are saying that you are paying ten thousand me as a new dispatcher because they always tell you ask for more ask for more i'm telling you mm -hmm. i need to be at nineteen thousand. how possible is that well you'll never get more if you don't ask for it what is what are well, you okay, you okay so that's what i said okay it's easier to go lower than to go up on my next on my next sli uh, slide i said well uh ask always for more money it's easier to go lower than to go up on the price but if I'm asking you seven, eight thousand, are you really gonna be sitting there and keep talking to me? I mean, I know guys are really, really quiet, patient guy. He probably not gonna hand up. If I would be a broker, I would be handing up every thirty seconds. I don't or have. Patience. One of my favorite things to do is if I offer ten thousand and someone, you know, they're like, "How about 16? So I'll hit them back with eight thousand. You know, <laughs> yeah. there's there's a tactic to negotiate on both ends. And you got to follow it. Just now, if someone's, if a broker is looking to pay ten thousand, they're not paying you sixteen thousand. Don't even ask. Start if you if you want more money. Start. You can even go to twelve thousand, which is still pushing it. But okay. know but, the value of your truck and negotiate from there. But but don't you think that the dispatcher need to understand if something doesn't make sense for them, transit price, uh, maybe produce. It's better just to say and decline an offer than try to do all these crazy numbers and all this stuff, right? Because to half hour might go by and market can change. Even the cherry market can change. The rain started. Let's say the rain started in Washington and it's gonna not gonna be picking up as much cherries. Well, in the morning you pay 12 grand. By the end of the day, the capacity is still there. You have drugs, but you don't have no loads. Are you still gonna pay 12 grand? No, because no. most of the trucks don't want to sit there for two days waiting. So now they're going to take the loads for nine, sometimes even eight and a half, right? But th that's also a risk though, right? So so like the real pro dispatchers, those are the ones that I hate. <laughs> I won't name drop any, but let's say, for example, last Friday in the morning, I was paying 11000 By the end of the day, a regular, someone that I know well, he, he knew the value of his truck. He knew that he was going to get a load. Instead of covering it at 8 a.m., he, he knew. He had three trucks. He said, I'm not covering them until 4 p.m. I ended up paying him $14,500. So I paid him $4,000 more than I would have in the morning because he knew the value of the truck. He knew that the rate was going to spike. And that was good on his part. But that could go either way. For, like, it can go said. either way, as I, as I said. Plus... <laughs> Also, you are in Washington. Experience, right? You are in Washington, right? Yeah, I, I understand you sit there till 4 p.m., but also we have transit, right? We need to make sure we go all the way East Coast unless unless we're not going to be talking about faking the logbook, right? So, I mean, it's still mm -hmm. going on, and it's a 
Good luck to everybody. But if you are pro dispatcher losing sometimes seven, eight hours on West Coast, if you're going to be booking load going all the way East Coast, believe me, you don't want to lose the time. Yes, maybe that extra 3000 sounds great. But you know what? It can backfire you so much that you're going to lose an extra day transit, being late to delivery, right? And I mean, yeah, it seems like he, he, did, he didn't play that card well this time, but I've been doing it for years. And you know what? What can I say? I, I think that loyalty is number one. Sometimes being greedy does not really help you because, in the end of the day, don't you think that you're going to remember that you have to overpay? It doesn't matter how good a relationship you have. Don't you think that one day you're still going to take back that money? <laughs> Yes, John. I mean, if you guys are paying when the market when the market's gonna go down, when the market's gonna go down, and he still need to cover those three trucks, well, you're probably not gonna pay him that eight five hundred or nine thousand, right? Yes. I couldn't really hear you that know? well. Alex, you're cutting out a little bit. Okay. So we have hard difficulties, so let's see how the next class is. We're going to be wrapping up. Maybe this is, we know what, we have a storm in Chicago. Can you hear me now? Still having technical difficulties. Okay. Um, uh, so let's talk about after you receive your confirmation. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Well, we need to make sure we confirm pickup, delivery, check all the details, get a quick time. Well, can you hear me now, guys? Right? It's a little better. A little better, yeah. I think we have the change. We have a storm going on. We have a question from Puma. She's asking, should you set up an account with you before we set up loads? Would, would it benefit to get set up with you guys before uh, doing any business? Do uh, yes. Do you set up here if they are not doing load yet? This is a question. Will you get set up or no? You say, how far do you need to commit to the load? We will set carriers up. Sometimes we get cold calls or even being in the Bronx market, we'll have carriers come knock on our door with their carrier packet. It doesn't happen often, but we will set carriers up when we're not doing a load. It's just having that load that you're booking with the carrier tends to be the starting point. Okay. So, let me tell this. What the main advice would you give to the new dispatcher? So they're not going to be terrified. Let's look at you guys. You're cute guys. You're not, not really screaming them without no Alex, I'm, I'm, the I'm sorry. We, we're getting every other word. Okay, you can hear. Okay, nobody in here. Well, I guess. <laughs> I hope people, yeah, people cannot hear us. So we don't know what's going on. I guess it's connection with stream. Or something. Uh, Alex, you sound like a robot. Okay, Ryan. You sound <laughs> like a robot. Well, hopefully, when we go post it and we go in to rewatch this on our YouTube, you guys can hear us. But, I mean, can you hear me? Or not? You can hear me, right? We, we get every other word. We can hear you. It just sounds like you're a little robotic and we're getting every every third word. Okay. Let me try to put the, uh, uh, our advertisement and trying to tell the analog. Hi guys, I know you can hear me, but I'm gonna text you. So let's talk about the training, freight broker training. Alex, do you want me to do you want me to call your cell? 
and I'll put you on speaker. Uh, yes. I think that that might be a better you know option. What? I'm calling you. I'm calling you right now. But uh, can you talk about the training we're going to have? Uh, yeah, uh, mute on the website. Yes. So let's, let's talk about the trade. Uh, what are we going to have in Sudan? How are you going to teach the people to become the brokers? Can you mute on the uh, the computer? Yes. And I'll put your voice through the mic. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. John, so can let's you hear talk it? about our training. All right. All right, we can hear you now. Tell me, what are we going to do in September? How are we going to teach the people to become freight brokers? So we have a basic outline of how the course structure would go. Um, we would start off with talking about the legal formation process, what different licenses you need, um, filing fees, insurance considerations, office location, equipment, brokerage software, as well as hiring and training procedures. Uh, then we would also talk about sales, negotiating with customers, where to find customers, um, how to turn. You don't turn a stranger into a customer. You know, there are many steps in between stranger and customer. Um, that's something we would go over as well, negotiating tactics. Then there's carrier relations, which include everything from having a DAT account, due diligence, signing them up, having carrier qualifications, um, Dispatching drivers, load tracking, more negotiating, accessorial charges, insurance claims, as well as building trust within your carrier base. That way they take care of your product and you take care of them should there be a claim or a breakdown. Sometimes we can protect our carriers from late fees and whatnot. Um, and one of the biggest things which comes after you know all of that is how to avoid scams as well as dealing with unsavory circumstances while at the same time protecting your company and its interests. Guy, do we still have Alex? Let me get her back on the phone. Yes, I've been, I've been texting Guy, so I'm seeing tell this us now. about, <laughs> it's bad. Tell about the new broker challenges, how to find that first first uh, customer are we going to be helping them with the guidelines how to do this um, guy so, do me a favor repeat that uh basically how how do you find your first customer like how do you get yourself in the door i i must i think that's the question she was asking how to find so, your customer sure so you could be looking for typically you can look for shippers you can try and target a specific um industry if you're targeting pharmaceuticals you might want to go looking for Something, here, Alex, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you well. Wonderful. So as far as targeting customers, if you're looking for produce, you're gonna start calling produce sheds. That is one of the easiest ways you become a, a member of the Produce Blue Book. You get a list of shippers and you start calling, you start making connections. You could do anything from just making a call once a day in the morning. Hey, what are you working on? What can I help you with? All the way up to and including business dinners, business lunches, um, golf outings. It, it just really depends on what knowing your customer and knowing what it is they're looking for aside from getting their freight covered. You want that value added service, not and just- well, this, All of this definitely takes time when you're trying to get your foot in the door. It's, it's, not, it's not overnight, it's gonna take time. You have to build a relationship. And like we mentioned earlier, you're gonna have to take losses a lot of the time you have to prove yourself essentially you have to prove your worth to your customers so they know that you can provide a service at a fair price and then okay. your, your relationship builds from there hopefully you can hear me now can you hear me now? no it, it's better you're still a little it's choppy better. but it's better okay how much money do you need to have to start a brokerage so it really depends on how many people you're hiring um you're going to need to um Get your surety bond, which, as you mentioned, is anywhere between seventy-five and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You're going to need a couple thousand dollars to form your business, go through the licensing procedure. Um, but that is something that, based off of a uh, the class breakdown, 
that would be one of the first things to go over is capital requirements as well as legal requirements in starting your own brokerage or your own trucking company. Do you believe that you should have some kind of knowledge of logistics before you start your freight broker? Absolutely. There are many different, um, many different books that are out there to get you started, but a book is not going to give you the real life knowledge and, and technical expertise of day-to-day -day operations that a course with two experienced uh, brokers would give you. Okay. So what do you think? Do you think that people should start maybe with dispatching first, maybe being a driver first, maybe for taking a few classes on the sales and techniques negotiation before they become and think that this is going to be so easy? Um, How you care? Any, any experience is good experience, right? So if you, if you want to go into the industry with experience, it's, it's not a bad idea. Is it necessary? Probably not but it's of course any experience helps right so if you come in with background knowledge you're at an advantage especially when it comes to negotiating it's not going to be a, a big deal knowing exactly which licenses you need because that's all that's all black and white everyone needs the same surety bond everyone needs the same licenses everyone needs insurance so if you, i'm sorry what was that no i'm just saying yes they all have the same requirements regulations yeah, so past that, it's going to be, are, are, do you have a dynamic personality? Can you not only provide the service, but a lot of these customers, they go with certain brokers because of the relationship they have with them. It goes beyond the service and it goes beyond the price. And that's something that is lost on a lot of brokers that come and go. Just like brokers, like I have a relationship with Alex, like we'll call just to chat, you know, like you need, you should and will build that relationship with your customer it's like at some point it's more than just business you know once you build a relationship but in the end of the day if i am organized person if i am detail oriented if i am uh have personality i'm a hard working person can i make it happen of course yeah. yes yeah and you have to take the word no out of your vocabulary when your customer says jump you say how high and where do you want me to land and you make it happen you're there to solve a problem and not create one and as long as you do that you'll keep your customers happy and they will continue to give you business and even expand your business okay and how important to understand the market changes to not shoot yourself in the food and not to underbid those prices right yeah one of the biggest factors of running a brokerage is you have to know or at least you have to try to predict as best as you can market shifts changes in price you don't want to underquote you don't want to overquote you want to make sure you get the business and that you can make money that's that's why everyone's in this industry in the first place is to make money so yeah it's very important obviously that's something that we will discuss in the course there's changes through seasons throughout with holidays coming up well, um, and as for me, you guys gonna get all the regulations, all the safe, how to get set up, how to check on carriers, and from you guys, you gonna teach us the commodities, how to cold call, how to make sure you calculate the freight, right? So together, I think we're gonna have Ethan's uh, class, and we're gonna make sure that you guys know what you are doing. But in the beginning, you all need to learn the basics. So I would suggest start learning terminology. And I would not jump that high if you don't understand the basics of logistics, right? I mean, logistics is still a science. It's not just A to B. It's a lot of things involved. It's regulations. It's cost per mile. It's your profit, profitability, your liability, your risk, uninsured risk. So is it worth it to do with some things or not? So it's a lot of involved to become a successful freight broker, right? Because we've seen so many who are open up, but they do not live way longer. Some carriers, they close their doors within three months, six months, one year, two years, same with the brokerage. Let me ask you this, Smith. Most of the guys say, well, first you need to go and work to the, in a big brokerage, and then you should steal their clients. What do you I'd, think? I'd be very careful doing something like that. A lot of these brokerages, will have clauses within your contract and it'll state, for example, either 
you can't back solicit at all or you can't back solicit for a certain amount of period after your employment ends. A lot of these contracts say that if you do back solicit within that time period, they are due 30% of your gross profit margin or even your gross margins on the load until that time period ends. So while people do that, it's a lot easier and a lot less of a headache to just go find your own customers. Uh, let's uh, answer the last question. Uh, here is the question. Hold on. Uh, do you prefer book with the big or small carriers? Both, really. There's positives and negatives from both sides. A big carrier, like you mentioned earlier, there's a potential breakdown or something. You know that they're going to work with you to cover the problem. There's easier resolution with them. And just having a big carrier, they have more trucks. It makes everyone's job easier. They're, they're going to be more available when you need them. But with big carriers, for, like, for example, Prime, we have to give them five days notice on a lot of shipments. So, yeah, they're 20% under market, but most of our stuff is spot market day of pickup. So we can't use them on a lot of things. And then we have to use the smaller carriers, which we get better daily service, even if the price is higher. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much. Sorry for the connection. This is the first time it happened. I guess we did not predict we're going to have storm outside. Probably my internet is not working that well. It was a pleasure having you guys. I mean, you've been doing a great job. I love working with you for years and years. I referred a lot of carriers also to you guys. And just making sure that we are all on the same page. I mean, in the end of the day, the loads need to be delivered. The produce has to be picked up and we all have to make money. You on your side, I'm as a dispatcher, driver, because he is driving from A to B. So we are all in this business to make profit. And understanding this, I think, is the biggest, biggest challenge. Yeah. Understanding how to run your business that it's going to be profitable. But also understanding when market goes down, you need to have that extra account. So you can do your maintenance, preventive maintenance. So maybe you will need to pay for that load right now, right? Like you guys pay extra money for cherry sometimes just to, like you said, please, the customer. While well, logistics is dynamic, it's stressful, and it's no need to scream at each other, F word each other, or get pissed, right? We all human beings, sometimes we do, we do use those words, but just because we love each other so much, right? In the end of the day, we are all cool. Well, thank you so much, guys. Again, I hope to see you soon, and I will see you soon because we're going to be doing training. So we're going to be start uh, signing up people for that, and we're going to make sure that they succeed. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Alex. I'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.